ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الى يوم الدين اما بعد we're on week 3 of the classes dealing with Imam Ibn Qayyim's letter to a friend of his Allah yarhamu and this third week we're going to cover we're going to begin to cover essentials for achieving al-imama fi din uh, and we stopped on page uh, 20 one actually last week uh, and bi ta'ala will cover uh, these the first parts of this whole issue of al imama what does it mean to be an imam in the deen why should we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us an imam in the deen and what are the qualities that we have to have in order to be imams and inshallah ta'ala we're going to begin on page 21 very top of page 21 Allah exalted be he has praised his believing servants who beseech him to be people who are rightly guided and who stand out as role models for others to follow in their guidance he said in the ayah وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّتِنَا قُرَّةِ يَعْيُمْ وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا And those who say, Our Lord, grant us from among our wives and offspring comfort to our eyes and make us an example for the righteous. طيب, الحمد لله. ابن القيم رحمه الله تعالى here he says that Allah praised his believing servants who ask him, who beg him to be people who are rightly guided. People who are rightly guided. And then he mentions the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ which, which they translate here as a comfort to our eyes. And what will begin to cover inshallah is that kurrat ain when something is the comfort as, as it's translated here the comfort of your eyes that's actually a level that is beyond just loving something so it it actually means that you find delight in this in this thing so uh the dua here that the ibad al-Rahman are making, right? Because this is dua that is made, this, this comes in the context where? It says Surah Al-Furqan 74. So we're towards the very end of Surah Al-Furqan. And that last part of Surah Al-Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to us about the sifat or the characteristics of the servants of Ar-Rahman. So his chosen servants, they say, Rabbana Habalana. Uh, which hab means here to gift to us. And Allah is al-wahab. That's from his names, right? He is the, the one who gifts, if you will. Grant from us, give us a gift from amongst our wives and our offspring. Make them what? A delight to us. And make us waja'alna lil muttaqina imama. And make us for the muttaqeen and imam. Make us an imam. And we'll talk about why it's singular here, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, I forgot this part. Yes. I forgot to get the juices flowing. I noticed that when I saw some people looking. Okay, alhamdulillah. Tayyab, we need to ask some questions first so you can get your minds and get your minds ready, inshallah ta'ala. Tayyab, bismillah. Go ahead, read the first question. <laughs> What is Mujahid's tafsir for make us an imam? Why is the word imam singular here? What are the three types of supper? Is translating supper as patience okay? Talk about the consequences of succumbing to shubuhat and shahawat. 
How can they be repelled? Why was faith in the law's decree of other not explicitly mentioned among the fundamentals of Iman? So, uh, going back to, uh, to page 21 and the ayat that we have with us, let, let me just ask you this. What, what was the last thing we talked about last week? Okay, so the 10 points about what? what 10 points about what? The about, about the necessity of guidance. Why we are so in need of the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at every step. And the last one of those, Ibn Qayyim mentioned what? What was the 10th thing? Why do we need guidance and why is it important? It's, it's right there. It's, it's, not, it's not a trick question. Huh? He says, look at, the, look at, the, end of page, at the end of page 20. He said, a person who is guided to some matters, yet also needs guiding, advising, and directing others to what he was guided to, as this will maintain his guidance. This is from the fiqh of Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, by the way. You're not going to see this everywhere. That fiqh here, he's telling us, look, in order for you to continue being guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to take the opportunity to do what? Guide others. Teach them what you've learned. And you need guidance from Allah to have that uh, instilled in you to want to teach others. You understand? You need that guidance from Allah. And then when you guide other people, then what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meets that al jaza'u min jins al amal that the reward is what? Is of the same type as the as the deed, right? And so when you guide other people, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases his guidance for you. Similarly, you've heard the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, wallahu fi aun al 'abdi ma kana al 'abdu fi auni akhi. Allah will continue what? Helping his servant as long as that servant is helping his brother. So the al jazau min jins al amal that the reward is of the same type as the as the deed. So as long as you are taking that time to guide others, then that is an increase in guidance for you. You see the transition, and now, now what? Because that's important that you be from amongst the people who guide people, then you should be asking Allah to do what? To make you a person who guides others, to make you an imam. That's why he brings up this ayah. You see how he transitions into the ayah? Right. So, because again, a lot of people, they read this and they, if it can feel, if you're not following, it can feel disjointed. How did he get from this point to that point? But it's very logical. So, if you want to be somebody who is guiding other people and therefore getting increased guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you need to ask Allah to make you an imam. All right? And that is why from the sifat or from the characteristics of the servants of Ar-Rahman is that they ask Allah along with asking him to give them uh, from their wives and from their offspring, from their spouses and their offspring, a, 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 a delight to them. They also ask to make us an imam for the muttaqeen, for the people who are pious and righteous. Tayyip, what does it mean to make your, uh, when you ask Allah to make your, your spouses and your uh, children or your offspring a delight to you? Uh, Al-Hasan, rahimahullah ta'ala, Al-Hasan al-Basri, rahimahullah, uh, he was asked about this ayat. Is this uh, dealing with the dunya? Or, or the hereafter, right? That they, that they are a delight for us. And Al-Hasan rahimahullah ta'ala said, لا بل في الدنيا this is, this is referring to the dunya. Al-Mu'min yara zawjatahu wa waladahu yuti'oon Allah. When a believer sees his wife and his children obeying Allah, this is a, a delight to his eye. For, for a real believer. Subhanallah. Right? And then 
one of the Mufassireen said, يَسْأَلُونَ اللَّهَ لِأَزْوَاجِهِمْ وَذُرِّيَاتِهِمْ أَنْ يَهْدِيَهُمْ لِلْإِسْلَامِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they are asking Allah to, to guide their spouses and their children or their families to, to Islam. And uh, this is important when we think about what does it mean? What does it mean for my family to actually be somebody who delights me, right? is that you see them upon the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For a true believer, this means the world. This is better than them graduating from this school or from that school or getting this job or that job or having this business or reaching this milestone. All of that, if they're not obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does it really mean in the long run? What does it really mean? Subhanallah. So this is, this is some of what has come in the tafsir of making them a comfort to our eyes. As it relates to what does it mean, وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama, And make us an imam for the muttaqin, for the people of taqwa. Ibn Abbas says, Iqra. <laughs> Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, said, commenting, it means Oh Allah, Ya Allah, make people guided to the good through us. Abu Saleh commented, it means let people be guided through our guidance. And Mahul said... That's actually Mekhul, even though it, it looks like Mahul, yeah. but it's, it's Mekhul is his name. No. Mekhul said, it means let us be examples in righteousness so that the righteous follow our example. Tayyip, stop, stop there before we get to Mujahid's uh, tafsir. So Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and Huma uh, said who was the cousin of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and from the famous companions. Uh, even though he was young, he was young when the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam died. But he was from those whom the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam uh, kept close to him. He made dua for him. He said, Allahumma faqihu fi deen وَعَلِّمْهُ التَّعْوِيلِ Oh Allah, give him fiqh of the deen and teach him the interpretation of the Qur'an. And so uh, Ibn Abbas was one of the most famous scholars of tafsir. And he was even known amongst the companions who were much older than him. He was known to be a scholar of, of tafsir. طيب, he says that this means make the people guided to good through us. And Abu Saleh Rahimahullah Ta'ala, his name was Badan. Uh, he was from the, uh, from the great scholars of the Tabi'een. And the Tabi'een are who? They're the students of, of the Sahaba. They're the students of the companions. And he says it means let people be guided through our guidance. Okay? And Makhul, who died, who was also from the Tabi'in, but not, he wasn't from the Kibar Tabi'in. Yeah, he wasn't from the, the uh, each, each uh, level, if you will, like from the Tabi'in, and then those who come after them, that's bad Tabi'in. Even amongst that larger title, there are subcategories, if you will, right? So you have what they call the Kibar Tabi'in, right? Like, like Abu Saleh. Uh, by them, and then you have the Ausat al Tabi'in, right? Those in the middle, and then you have Sigar al Tabi'in, the, the latter ones from amongst them. So he's from the middle Tabi'in, Makhul. Uh, but he was a faqih, he was well known. Um, and so he says here, let us be examples in righteousness so that the righteous follow our example. So all of this is that we be what? Examples for, for other people who come after us. Play it. What did Mujahid say? Mujahid, really not right? No, Rahimahullah. Rahimahullah. Yeah. Commented, it means, oh Allah, make us followers of the righteous ones and let us follow their example. Type, who was, who was Mujahid? He was? He was a student of Ibn Abbas, Mujahid ibn Jabir, Rahimahullah. Also from the Kibar al Tabi'i. He was a student. He was one of. In terms of tafsir, he is the well-known student of Ibn Abbas. He said that he stopped Ibn Abbas at every ayah 
and the Quran and ask him what's the tafsir. Mm -hmm. All right? So, yeah, what did Mujahid say again? Mujahid commented, it means, oh, Allah, make us followers of the righteous ones and let us follow their example in righteousness. Mm, okay. So, Mujahid says, make us followers of the righteous ones and let us follow their example. Taya. Does it say anything about being a leader? Does it say anything about being an example for others? No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, it says we follow their example, not that we become an example for anybody else, right? So, so notice what it says here. Make us followers of the righteous ones and let us follow their example. Okay. Tell you, does that seem like that interpretation works? Or do you see an issue here? Depends on how you, how you look at it. Okay. Go ahead. How you look at it? <laughs> I mean, if you look at it from the perspective of the son and how you're supposed to follow the, the previous generation, if you, if you become one who is uh, righteous and should be followed, then people will follow you. Ahsant. Very good. Jazakallah khairan. Yeah. That's exactly... That's exactly what Ibn al-Qayyim is going to say about this, because some people didn't understand it that way. How, what does, if I'm saying, oh Allah, make me an iman, right? And then somebody else comes and says, that means, oh Allah, make me a follower, then it might not make sense right away, right, for some people. And this is what Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, is going to explain. By the way, just a, a side note, commercial break, Mekhul, Mekhul was, was not from, he was not Arab. And, and he couldn't pronounce Qaf. So instead of saying Qul, he would say Qul. So <laughs> they say he used, to have a, he used to have a lot of problems. And, and I remember there was a, it was a brother who, um, who, who used to sit in the same Quran circle when we were, when we were in Medina. And we used to, when we first got there, um, we used to sit with the children because that's how you, yeah, that's how you, learn. that's how you learn. I mean, um, we weren't at the level where they allow you to, you know, sit, to to read to the to the big shakes yet. Because I mean, we're coming from America, we don't know any better. But um, so anyway, this this brother was reading from Surah Al Baqarah, and um, he said, "Kum man kana adu wa li Jibril, fa inna hu nazzalahu ala kalbik, huh? Not kalbik because he couldn't pronounce qaf." It, it, whoever is a whoever is an enemy to Jibreel, قُلْ مَنْ كَانَ عَدُوَ لِجِبْرِيلَ فَإِنَّهُ نَزَّلَهُ Say whoever whoever from amongst you is an enemy to Jibreel, then know that he sent it down. Yani Allah subhanahu wa taala sent it down through Jibreel, على قلبك on your heart to, to your heart. If you say على كلبك, what's that mean? Dog. To your dog, not to your. The Quran teacher almost had a conniption. I'm talking about flipped out. He was like, what do you mean? What do you mean? He said, Qalbik. You know, like really correct them. Anyway, so when I when I um that's just a commercial break. So when I when I when I think of Mekhul, I, I think of that uh, of that ayah, subhanAllah. Allah Huh? I just helped you just yeah, when you said Mekhul, huh? Mekhul. Yeah, but, but that's, subhanAllah, even though he was a faqih, I mean, he was an imam, uh, makhul, but he, he couldn't pronounce the qaf, subhanAllah. Uh, which, which, is, uh, which is encouraging, honestly. I mean, even, it, what it means is that even without proper pronunciation, you can still become a faqih, inshallah. Be an imam and a deen. Now, okay, mujahid, right. So the issue here is what that, uh, Mujahid said what? Make us followers. You see that here? Make us followers of the muttaqin. Emulating them. Whereas everybody, the, the other tepsiers that you see talk about the, the making us what? Making us a role model and an example for, for the righteous people. So it is a little different uh, in its appearance. Yes. Father Sheikh, come on. The explanation of Mujahid was found problematic by those who did not comprehend the knowledge of the righteous predecessors or realize the depth of knowledge they had. For this reason, they objected by arguing that, according to his explanation, 
the meaning of the ayah will be reversed to me, O oh Allah, make the righteous be the example we follow. I seek refuge in Allah from such a treatment. From statement, such a statement. From a sta such a statement because it is impossible to find any ayah with reversed meaning in the Quran because the statement of Mujahid may Allah engulf him with his mercy. I, I'm not sure about the double because here. So he so first of all, Ibn al Qayyim is just seeking refuge with Allah. I say Allah forbid that any of the statements in the Quran have a reversed meaning. Right? They all mean what they mean without reversing them uh, around. And he's saying that the statement of Mujahid, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, actually means what? It indicates his perfect indicates his perfect comprehension since it is obvious that a person cannot be an example that the righteous follow his leads unless he himself follows the example of the righteous ones right so this is basically what was being said before right which is that um a a person is not going to be an imam worthy of being followed right until he himself becomes a follower of the imams before him. And so this is what Mujahid is saying. Make us from amongst the true followers of, of the a'imma. And it's like Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala say, Yaka, and tatakallama fi mas'alatin laysa laka fiha imam. Beware of speaking about an issue in which you don't have an imam for that statement. Making up your own you know, interpretation of things. Beware of that. This is what Imam Ahmed is saying. So, even our Prophet والسلام, was told by Allah to do what? Ittabi' millata Ibrahim Hanifa. You follow, you follow, talking to the Prophet والسلام, follow the millah, uh, the, the, the way of Ibrahim. So, even our Prophet والسلام, in that sense, did not deviate from the message of the prophets who came before him and in fact was a follower of the way of Ibrahim in terms of his, uh, he was Hanif, that is turning away from the obedience of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the worship of other than Allah and turning to the obedience of Allah Jalla Jalal. So that being said, a person who's asking Allah to become an imam, which we should ask, because sometimes people think, well, you know, we shouldn't be asking Allah for positions of leadership. That's true, but this is different. It's not asking Allah to make you a leader in the sense that you are in front of the people, that you are some type of sultan and you have authority or so forth. It's, it's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you a role model for the people of, of righteousness, which means that, which means that and entails that you have to follow the righteous who came prior to you. Now. This is the aspect that Mujahid intended to highlight, which explains how a person can attain this high rank. That is by following the example of the righteous people who preceded him. So as Allah makes the righteous ones succeeding him in time to follow his example. Truly, this is from the best understanding of Quran. And as explained, it is irrelevant to the issue of reverse Meaning. I'm not sure it got irrelevant, but it basically has nothing to do with, with the reversed meaning. Now, That being the case, whoever follows the example of the predecessors who adhere to the Sunnah, his example will be followed by those who succeed him in time, and also by those who live in the same era of his. The word imana, translated to an example for, is used in its singular form, and, as can be noted, Allah, the Most High, did not use the plural form of the work. It should, say, it should say word instead of work. Okay. Yeah. Plural form of the word, as the ayah did not lead to say, make us examples for the righteous. Okay, so, so let, let's just explain. Okay, what's the issue here? The issue here is, it says, وَجَعَلْنَا Make us. Make us what? Uh... And imam. So why doesn't it say make us imams of the righteous? Why does it say make us and imam? Do you understand the, the issue? Because us is what? Plural. Plural. Right. So why doesn't it say make us imams? Why isn't the word imam 
plural. Why doesn't it say imams or a'imma? And it just says imam. Why is it singular instead of plural? This is what he's going to explain right now. Right. This has been explained by many scholars, some of whom explain that the word imam is the plural of the word am. But this interpretation is far-fetched and uncommon to be found in the famous usage of the Arabic language. Hence, such understanding cannot be used to interpret or explain the words of the law. Other scholars said that the word imam is not an ism. That is, uh, boy, they say jaran. Jaran is an I-M-G word, uh, right. usually. Yeah, that, that, that shouldn't. Yeah. OK, it's not an ism. But rather a mascot. It's not a noun, but rather a mascot. The, the, the mustard is usually what they translate as a gerund, even though a yeah. mustard is is a verbal noun. It doesn't necessarily have to have ing at the end. Yeah. That is a noun that is derived from a verb and usually preserves the verb's syntactic features. You guys got that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hence, it implies the meaning make us to have any man. And this interpretation is an even, is an ever weaker opinion. It, it, it's actually, it, it should say an even weaker, is an, is even, is an even weaker opinion than the af aforementioned one. Yeah. Anyway, don't, we, you don't have to get too far into that. This is, this is the more important part right here. al farah said. al farah said, the reason why the word imam was used in a singular format, and that's plural, is because it falls under the category of the singular that is intended to refer to a plural, just like the word messenger used in the ayah, we are the messenger of the Lord of the world. Right. Inna, inna, we are Rasulu, the messenger, Rabbil Alameen, of Rabbil Alameen, right? Play it. So, so here, this is, it says here, uh, where the word used is singular, Rasul, Though it refers to two persons because it's talking about both Musa and Harun salam. But only the singular was used. Why? Yeah. Uh, where and used in the ayah, we are the messenger of the Lord of the of worlds. And that, and that's not the only place where that comes in the Quran, by the way. And it's not the only place where it's used in the Arabic language, where where a singular is used and the meaning is plural. No. Where the word used is singular, though it refers to two persons. This interpretation is the best, is the best of all, but still requires further elucidation. Uh-huh. Still requires further elucidation, meaning why? Why is it that the singular is used here? Even though that's permissible from a linguistic perspective and that happens in the language and sometimes the singular is used and it means the plural, but why here does it say, وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا? Why is it, why are we only talking about one here? Father he says. Elucidation is one of the Sheikh's big five syllable words. <laughs> Elucidation. Wow, that is a five syllable word. Law Akbar. Now. This interpretation is the best of all, but still requires further elucidation. That is, all the righteous people walk in the same path, worship the same Elah, same God, adhere to the same book, believe in the same prophet, and they are and they are all the servants of one Lord. That is, their religion is the same. Their prophet is the same. Hence, the divine book is the same. And the ilah that they worship is the same. Hence, it is as if all of this makes out the imam that they follow. In other words, it's as if they're all what? One example. As if, it's as if they're all one example. Even though there are many of them, they're one example because they're all following the same way. No. This is the absolute opposite of the case of imams whose views, paths, beliefs, creed, and methodology are different. Thus, in reality, following the example of the righteous means following what they are upon. No. No. Gee. So if we were to sum that up, why did... Why is the word imam singular here instead of plural? Right. So, and, and that is why, subhanAllah, I mean, you can go to the real imams, uh, and it's not, that, it's not that they won't differ in opinion, like that they won't come to different conclusions. 
but their way is still the same. Their way is still the same. Their methodology of interpreting text is still the same. Now, how the, the fact that that leads to different conclusions is okay um, because that's just the reality of the human being. That's why some of the campaigns heard from the Prophet Salaam, don't pray Asad until such and such. And some of them thought that that meant what? To hurry up and get there and pray Asad. And some of them said, nope, this is exactly what the Prophet Sallallahu said. And so they interpreted what they heard from the Prophet Sallallahu in two different ways. And neither one of the, those groups were sinful. Only one of the, only one possible meaning. The Prophet Sallallahu couldn't have possibly meant both because they couldn't do both. So the Prophet Sallallahu only meant one thing. But the fact that they heard that, and it was possible to interpret it two different ways, they still were going back to what? To what the Prophet ﷺ said. You understand? That was their source. And it wasn't their intellects or what they thought might be better or whatever. They were still going back to that. It's just the fact that they understood it differently. Right? So the sources uh, are the same. Now. Uh, chapter 1? Yes, sir. Patience, I suffer. And by, by the way, Ibn al-Qayyim did not say al-fasl al-awwal, al-fasl al thani or anything like that. This is just from the, the translator uh, and perhaps I mean, the book that they got it from in Arabic, but it just says fasl, chapter. All right, Qayyim. Oh, yeah. Patience, I suffer, and certainty, al yaqeen Allah Most High informed us that the state of being an imam in religion, that is a religious person, whom people take as a role model to follow his steps, is earned, is earned through patience and certainty. He said, what you tell you, I don't I don't particularly like the translation is earned. Yeah. Um and that's that's not exactly what it says. It, it's in Arabic it says tunan, yani it's reached. So how do so again What's the dua here? The dua is waja'anna, huh? Who can say it in Arabic? Waja'anna lil muttaqina imama, right? Obviously that's not a dua by itself, right? So the dua starts off with Rabbana, right? Hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyyatina qurrata ayun waja'anna lil muttaqina imama. Right. So, okay. If you make dua to become an imam in the deen then what do you need to know? Tayyip, let's take a step back. In the beginning, Ibn Qayyim made dua to, for his friend Alauddin that Allah make him what? Mubarakan. Huh? That he make him, right, there you go. That he make him Mubarak. That he make him blessed, wherever he may be. And then he started talking about what? Then he started talking about Barakah. Being blessed. Well, what does that entail? Because if you, if I'm making dua for you to be that, then you need to know what it takes to, to be that, right? So now, if we make dua for Allah to make us what, an imam, then I need to know what. Well, how? What does it take to become an imam? I need to know what those qualities are. Do you see how the book is set up? And why is that? Because we don't make dua without bedlu sabab. We don't make du'a without putting forth the, the what? The effort to get what it is that we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. All right? Let, let me rephrase that. I think we don't make du'a without that. You make du'a, you should make du'a. Right? But from the completion of your du'a is what? Is that you put forth the effort that is necessary to get to what it is that you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. Okay? Tay. So now we're going to learn what it is, what qualities are necessary to become from the imma or to become an imam. Now. From Surah to 
the translation of the meaning, and we made from among them leaders, guided by our command, when they were patient, and when they were certain of our signs. Mm -hmm. It is therefore with supper, with patience and certainty, yatim, that a person can reach the status of, of al-imana. Al -ima al Notice that he says reach the status, even though before he translated it as earned. Right. So reached um, is, is closer because it's the same exact word in Arabic in both places. The scholars offer different interpretations so, of... Right. So this, he's taking this directly from uh, Shaykh al-Islam al-Taymi, rahimahullah ta'ala, who says several places in his books, وَبِالصَّبْرِ وَالْيَقِينَ تُنَالُوا الْإِمَامَةُ فِي الدِّينَ With sabr and yaqeen, the status of imamah, being an imam and the, and the religion is reached. Through what? Through sabr and what? And yaqeen. طيب. So he's going to talk about both of these uh, in the coming pages, inshallah. What is sabr and what is yaqeen? Now. Some said it is to be patient with respect to this worldly life, that is, abstain with perseverance from unlawful and sinful worldly pleasures. And some said it is to be patient with the hot hardships that befall. And some said it is to avoid the unlawful with perseverance. The correct interpretation, however, <coughs> is that it is to have perseverance over all that, to perform the obligations that Allah ordained on us with perseverance, to avoid all that which Allah forbade with perseverance, and to have perseverance over all that which Allah has decreed and predestined for us. All right, so this definition is actually going to come back uh, at the end of page 27, so just in two pages. But, uh, but I'll talk about it briefly here, um, and, then, and then we'll go over it in a little more detail because the definition on the next page uh, is the one that I want you to pay attention to, inshallah, or in two pages. So here, again, he's saying that sabr is of three types, correct? What's the first? Sabr as it relates to Allah's commands. That's a, and I don't want you to translate it. I just want you to think about sabr. Now, sabr from a linguistic standpoint means habs and nafs. Habs and nafs. So, habs is what? Does anybody know what habs means? To restrain, to constrict, right? If somebody is, is uh, or, or for example, if you, put a, um, if you put a pet inside a cage, you're taking a pet to the vet, you say that it's mahbus, right? Because it's encaged. So, habs and nafs is like you, you restrain, you put your nafs in a cage, you restrain it, okay? You got me? So that's sabr. That's what I want you to understand. That's what sabr means linguistically. So, but it has three different types. There's sabr with the law's commands, with his obedience. There's sabr as it relates to. Huh? That's ta. And then there's sabr an al masiyah. So there's sabr as it relates to disobedience. Which means, what do you think that, so what do you think sabr as it relates to obedience means? To, 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 to be, to have the forbearance, right? To, con, to confine yourself huh, to Allah's commands and not to go outside of that. So it's as if you are boxing yourself in to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Clear? Tayyip. So what does it mean, sabr, as it relates to Allah's ma'asiyah? Right, to, re, to re, restrict yourself, to refrain from entering into those boundaries where th th that would be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's disobedience, right? So you're keeping yourself in the field of obedience. You're restricting yourself from going to that area of disobedience. And then what do you think sabr means as it relates to Allah's decree? Tayyib, how, how does it relate to sabr, which is habs and nafs, to restrict, to refrain from, to... To refrain from questioning his decree, from complaining about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree. Right? So this is part of a sabr. 
This is part of sabr, as it relates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree, which will come uh, in a little bit, inshallah ta'ala, as we discuss it further. Yes? Um, well, please, at, at your convenience, more of an explanation on if something bad happens, we are supposed to have a certain attitude. Uh, uh, more yeah. please. Inshallah. 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 Now. Uh, Allah Most High. Allah Most High combines patience with certainty in the said ayah because the source of happiness of Allah's slaves emanates from them. It comes from them. And without them, Allah's slaves become detached from it. Okay, please, please pay attention here. So the author here is saying what? That sabr and yaqeen do what? They make up the, they, they constitute the happiness, true happiness of a person. Without sabr and without yaqeen, therefore, a person cannot find true happiness in this life. Type. That's important for us to really kind of break this down. I want you to be able to talk about this. So he says here, this is because Allah the Most High combined patience with certainty. And this said I, because the source of happiness of Allah's slaves emanates from them. And without them, Allah's slaves become detached from it. What is it talking about here? Huh? What is it? Let. Content. Cont happiness. It is happiness. So without these two, he's saying that a person cannot be happy. Now, what is happy? Good. So is, is happy something you do or something you feel? It's something you feel. Okay, that, that's in general. Because <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole field now they call it the psychology of happiness. And that's it. It's, but for our purposes, for our purposes, happiness is, a, is the feeling of contentment. Okay? It's, the, it's a feeling. It's when you feel at ease. Time. Because if you're, if you're agitated, then are you happy? If, if, there's, if, if, you have, if something inside of you, if there's conflicting emotions inside, are you, are you happy? You, are you settled? There's no real ease there, right? There's no real peace. There's no real tranquility. So he's saying that in order to achieve that, in order to really feel peace inside, to feel that contentment, then you have to have both sabr and you have to have yaqeen. Type no, no, no. Just read, inshallah. Okay. Read, and it'll come. You'll see, inshallah. I've been waiting this for two decades. Tayyip Sheikh, it's coming, it's coming, inshallah. <laughs> have some sabr. <laughs> that is, this is because the heart is often exposed to the knocks of the sinful, of the sinful desires that contravene, go, go against, contravenes, contravene Allah's orders, and to the knocks of the doubts that contravene the divine revealed text. However, with perseverance, such desires, shahawat, are cast away, and with certainty, such doubts as shuhuhat are pushed out. For sinful desires, that is, ashahwa, and doubt, a shubha, a Shub, shubha. 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 No, mm -hmm. thank you. Oppose all the aspects of religion. All the aspects of religion. Mm -hmm. Only those who are pushed away. No, only those who push away right. their desires with perseverance, that is, a suburb, and barred their doubts with certainty, al yakin only will be saved from Allah's punishment. Okay. That is Allah. Yeah. Ta'ala said. No, 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 no. We'll, 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 we'll get. We'll, we'll get. We'll get. We'll get. We'll get to what it says. We'll get to what it says. Inshallah. All right. So, so okay. Let, let's let's take this step by step so that we understand. Uh, sabr is needed to adhere to Allah's commands and to avoid His prohibitions. Otherwise, without sabr. Nobody's praying. If, if you don't have sabr, you're not going to pray five times a day. If you don't have sabr, you're not going to do siyam, which is, which is also a form of sabr. 
So without sabr, you're not, you're not going to fulfill the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without sabr, you're not going to avoid his prohibitions, some of which are very enticing, right? So you have to have sabr to avoid those prohibitions and to fulfill Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands. And you need sabr to have that balance in dealing with the calamities that befall you. And every single human being deals with some level of calamity because this is the dunya and it's not Jannah. And so part of our test in this life is that we are tested with calamities. So you need sabr to deal with all of that. Clear so far? Tight. You need yaqeen so that your faith in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed you of does not waver. Because without that yaqeen, then you're not really sure. Right? You're not really sure. You're not sure of the command itself, and you're not sure of the reward. Did Allah really command me to do this or prohibit me from that? So if you're not sure, you might not do some of the things that Allah commanded you to do. And you may not avoid some of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited you from. And if you're not sure about the reward for those things, then you won't have the sabr to do them. Like Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala says in a different place. He says that in order to reach your destination, you need quwwati sabrin wa quwwati yaqeen. You need very strong sabr and you need strong yaqeen. He said it's like a man. A person who enters upon a very scary path. But that path leads to the epitome of safety and security. He knows when he gets to the end of that path, alhamdulillah, he made it to the finish line, he's good. So you think about going down a very dark path that's kind of scary, and you know that there's some things when you might have to, you know, you might get some bruises along the way. You have to defend yourself, right? It's a scary path. But you know that when you get to the end, alhamdulillah, that's all over. It's all behind you. You don't have to deal with that again, and there's a great reward waiting for you. And so you're in this dark tunnel, and you can see that light at the end, right? Now imagine that light starts flickering. You're like, wait a minute. Is it really going to be light when I get there, or is it going to go out? That's, that's what? That's shuck. That's a doubt. Your, your yaqeen is being what? It's be, at this point, it's being tested, right? Or, and, and then what happens as a result of your yaqeen being tested is that what? You start to lose patience. You, you start to lose sabr because you're like, man, I'm going through all this. Is it really going to lead me to what I want? And so you see they're interdependent. Without sabr, without that sabr, you're not going to get to the station of yaqeen. And without yaqeen, you're not going to, be, you're not going to have sabr. It's going to affect your sabr. And both of them are going to, that, and that's why they, they're interdependent, as you'll, as you'll see when we come on, inshallah. So, so what happens now? Allah's command, his amr, as you can see here, right? The amr means command. Allah commands us with certain things in the Quran, and he informs us of other things in the Quran. The Quran is made up of those two, al-awamir wal-akhbar. Clear? Well, al-awamir here, we're talking about commands. That commands also includes the prohibitions, because it's a, it's a, 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 a prohibition is actually commanding you not to do something, right? So it's still a form of command. So Allah is commanding us to do some things. Those things require from us what? Sabr. They require from us sabr. And Allah Azza wa Jal informs us of other things. And what he informs us of requires from us what? Yaqeen. Now, what is it that contradicts our sabr? What is it that now weakens our willpower? Shahawat. Shahawat. The, the, these, these sinful desires. So they come in and they mess with that ability to, to be patient and to persevere and to endure and to restrain, right? Hubs and nafs. 
So, so shahawat contradicts your sabr. And what is it that contradicts your yaqeen? The shubuhat, which is often translated as doubts. Okay? Other people translate it, and this is a better translation, though it's, it's not often used. Specious arguments, which is close, because a doubt is different. A, a, a shubha is actually something that is plausible, looks like this could be, but it's incorrect. It's not right. And that's what specious means. So a specious argument is something that, an argument that somebody makes, right, that has some connection to reality, but it's false. And this is what a shubha is. All right? So some people translate shubha as doubtful matters, but it doesn't really give you what it is. Shubha is affecting your knowledge. It's making you believe something that you shouldn't believe. All right? So what is it that affects your yaqeen or contradicts your yaqeen is shubuhat. And what is it that affects your sabr? Huh? Shahawat. Now, how is this... And what, what, why is this something that affects the, the entirety of the deen? Because the entirety of the deen is what? Beneficial knowledge and, and righteous actions. Right? Beneficial knowledge comes on this side. Allah's khabar. And righteous action comes on... Uh, Afwan. Now, and righteous actions comes on this side, which is Allah's amr. His commands. His prohibitions. And therefore, shubuhat and shahawat totally destroy the religion if a person succumbs to them. Clear? Yes, sir. Taib, alhamdulillah. Right. And so, here, the Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, after talking about the importance of sabr and yaqeen, because how do you ward off? How do you ward off shubuhat? With yaqeen. How do you ward off shubuhat? I mean shahawat? With sabr. Right? And this is why whoever attains sabr and yaqeen will become an imam in the deen. And his imamship will be in according to his level of sabr and yaqeen. So then Ibn Qayyim goes on to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us that people's deeds are nullified if they succumb to shubuhat and shahawat, if they succumb to desires and these doubts. That, that they will, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will what? Nullify their deeds. And if Allah nullifies their deeds, then they are lost. And they will have lost, nothing but loss. And the hereafter, they will be from the khasirin, from those who have lost. All right? So, and they will not attain salvation. Allah Azza wa Jal says, كَالَّذِينَ مَنْ قَبْلِكُمْ كَانُوا أَشَدَّ مِنْكُمْ كُوَّةً وَأَكْثَرَ أَمْوَالًا وَأَوْلَادًا فَاسْتَمْتَعُوا بِخَلَاقِهِمْ كَمَا فَاسْتَمْتَعُوا بِخَلَاقِهِمْ فَاسْتَمْتَعْتُمْ بِخَلَاقِكُمْ كَمَا اسْتَمْتَعَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ بِخَلَاقِهِمْ وَخُضْتُمْ كَالَّذِي خَاضُوا Now, uh, you can read it from up here, Sheikh. Oh, hypocrites, you are like those who came before you, who are more powerful than you and more abundant in wealth and children. They enjoyed their share of worldly pleasures, and you have been enjoying your share, just as those who came before you enjoyed their share. And you have been indulging in idle talk just as they did. Such are the ones whose deeds will come to nothing in this world. And in the hereafter, such are the ones who are the losers. Such are the ones whose deeds will come to nothing in this world. Who are those who will, whose deeds will come to nothing in this world? Those who, what, have enjoyed their share of this dunya, right? But not in a manner that's pleasing to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those who indulge, here it says, in idle talk. Right? So, so both of those, as we'll see, are the direct uh, correspondence to shubuhat and shahawat. The shahawat are enjoying the pleasures of this dunya unlawfully, and the shubuhat is just engaged in what? 
as he says here, I, the translation says idle talk. But we're going to read what an Imam al Sa'di, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, says uh, about this, inshallah Ta'ala. But before we get there, let's just look at what the consequences of embracing shahawat and shubhat are. The first is that anytime you have the, 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 a, a person embraces a shubha or a shahwa, there's going to be internal conflict. What does that mean, that there's internal conflict? You're fighting within yourself, right? Because this is something that's wrong, and you're still doing it. So there's a there's a what? There's a fight, especially if a person has a fitra that is intact, right? If their fitra is intact too, then it, then it's going to be uh, that that internal struggle. But at the end of the day, the only thing that really brings tranquility to the heart is what? The remembrance of Allah, Subhanahu wa Taala. And so this person is turning away from that remembrance, either through following sinful desires or through believing something that they should not believe. The second thing is that it nullifies good deeds. And this is what it says in this particular ayah. Those people's good deeds will be nullified. Okay? And it puts their salvation in jeopardy in the hereafter. Sa'di says, your deeds are like theirs. Read from there. Allah has told us of your deeds are like theirs. No, Allah has told us that, that that's related to the last sentence. Your deeds are like theirs. Your deeds are like theirs. And you are enjoying, you are enjoying your share of worldly pleasures. Using it to fulfill your desires and turning away from the purpose for which it was given. We can, we can enjoy worldly pleasures. That's not the problem. It's if, but they have to be used in a manner that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have to be used in a manner that is lawful, and most of them, most of your worldly pleasures should be used to help you get to the hereafter. You are using it for sinful purposes, and your aspirations do not go beyond that which you were given of worldly pleasures, as was the case with those who came before you. All right, so that's what it means. This portion of the ayat uh, where it says they enjoyed their portion of worldly enjoyment and you have enjoyed your portion as those before you enjoyed their portion. That's what it means. Okay? This is the meaning here. It doesn't just mean that you enjoyed it like there's something wrong with enjoying the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. It means that you used it for sinful purposes. No. And you have Yes. And you have been indulging in idle talk just as they did. That is, you have been indulging in falsehood and arguing on the basis of falsehood so as to ward off the truth. This is what they did, and it was all they knew, namely enjoying their share of worldly pleasures and indulging in falsehood. And their false speech was because of their false beliefs. Okay? Now, thus? Thus they deserved the punishment and doom, and did as did those who came before them, who did the same as they did. Mm -hmm. As for the believers, even though they may enjoy their share of worldly pleasures and whatever they are granted uh, us granted in this world, they do so in a way that helps them to obey Allah. Subhanallah. And that is, that's the beauty of a true believer, right? The Prophet ﷺ had companions who were wealthy. And they used that wealth to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they did good for their families. It wasn't that they, it wasn't that they put all of their money, other than Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala. But it wasn't that they gave all of their money for Yisrailillah and so forth. But they used a good portion of their wealth to support the deen. Right? And to do those things, to take care of the orphans, to take care of the the poor, to feed the needy. They used their wealth in a way that was going to be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. With regard to the knowledge they have, it is knowledge that they learned from the messengers. This is the type of knowledge that helps them to attain certain faith in all that they try to achieve. The certain faith, yaqeen. Okay? So the knowledge that comes from the messengers, right? and specifically that which comes from the Prophet ﷺ, by way of the Qur'an and Sunnah, this is what promotes yaqeen. This is what promotes true certainty in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those tenets of faith that we have to believe in. Now, and it helps them to argue on the basis of truth in order to refute falsehood. We have four minutes left. Um, and inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to finish reading this on page 26, 
Go back to page 26. It says, the part that says enjoyed their portion of worldly enjoyment refers to their enjoyment of their share of sinful desires, while the part engaged in vanities like that in which they engaged refers to engaging in false and unlawful matters regarding the religion of Allah. And he's referring to vain and false topics of the people of doubts. And this is, again, when it says the people of doubts, even though it, it, we're talking about what word in Arabic? Shubuhat. Ahl al-shubuhat. Because a lot of times, again, when we think about doubts, you, you have to think about an argument that is made that is what? It, it's, it, it's plausible. It's possible. It's just not the truth. Okay? And, and that's what they're talking about here. The end of the ayah, أُولَٰئِكَ حَبِطَتْ أَعْمَالُهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ It is those whose deeds have become worthless in this world. They're nullified. In this world and in the hereafter, it is they who are the losers. وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ And those who are the losers in the hereafter are those who do not go to Jannah. Right? Because this is the ultimate reward. Allah mentioned that the result of such a state, namely becoming losers and their deeds becoming worthless, depends on their following of desires. I don't, I don't like, I, not depends on, but it's, it's the result of. So instead of depends on, if you want to cross that and say, is the result of. It's the result of them following their desires, which is enjoying their portion of worldly pleasures, and on following shubuhat, which is engaging in false and vain topics. Tayyip. So therefore, and we're going to talk about this, inshallah. Uh, I was hoping to get done this part today. Um, 27, 28, and 20, and parts of 29. We're not going to get there due to the time. But there are four essentials for imama, as, as we're going to see here. Okay? And that part we will read just as a prelude to, uh, to what's coming, inshallah, next week. So in the beginning of page... 27, it says chapter 2, guiding people and calling them to Allah and his messenger. Everybody see that? He says, aside from the two previously mentioned requirements, that is, what? Sabr and Yaqeen. The ayah brings to attention two other principles, the first of which is calling people to Allah and guiding them. Yahduna, Yahduna. They guide, I mean, they guide other people. And the second one is guiding people to Allah according to what he ordained and ordered through his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not according to their intellect or their opinions or policies or preferences and the blind following of their forefathers without having evidence from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to become an imam in the deen, there has to be sabr and yaqeen. There has to be that element of guiding others and guiding others in accordance to the way of the Prophet ﷺ, which we've translated here as compliance, we'll pick up there, inshallah ta'ala, next week. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.